بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا فما بعد ما بعد أن سجدت the um, we come to one of the most significant signposts uh, in the Sira of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم the changing of the Qibla from Masjid Al Aqsa which was north towards the Kaaba, which was south. This happened uh, in the 18th year of, uh, of, of uh, Risala. And uh, as you know, as we all know, Salah is obligatory. It is a pillar of Islam. And uh, the five uh, Salahs are unique to Islam. Um, and uh, this is something which is uh, fard on the Muslim. A Muslim who deliberately leaves Salah has left Islam. Uh, if somebody leaves Salah, then he must make it, make it up. He must, by mistake, if it happens and so on, then the Salah must be, uh, must be made up. But deliberately leaving it, whatever be the reason, this is haram in Islam. A Salah that is left deliberately cannot be made up. And uh, a person, if he deliberately leaves even one Salah, the ruling of Rasulullah and the Sahaba and all the ulama is that the person has left Islam. So, <clears throat> um, before um, Isra al Miraj, uh, Salah was not obligatory, although Muslims prayed. They prayed, uh, they usually used to pray two rakat in the morning and two uh, at night. Um, also, they used to pray in the Hajjud in the night, uh, two and more rakat and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this also in Surah Musab Muzamil but uh, prescribed obligatory five daily salawat uh, happened only after the uh, Isra wal Miraj <coughs> and Isra wal Miraj happened uh, roughly about a year or year and a half before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's uh, migration to Medina um, so this uh, time, uh, Jerusalem or Masjid Al Aqsa really was the uh, was the qibla, and Rasulullah and the Sahaba used to pray facing uh, Masjid Al Aqsa. Now, when they were when they used to pray in the in Makkah, the way they prayed and the direction they prayed in, even though they were facing Masjid Al Aqsa, the Kaaba was in in between them and Masjid Al Aqsa. So. This was uh, how uh, the prayer was, and thanks to the physical location of uh, of Makkah and, and Kaaba in it, and Baitul Maqsas, of course, uh, thousand thousand miles away, almost. Um, then uh, the Rasulullah sallallahu um, they continued to pay uh, to face the same qibla even when they went to uh, Medina. We have the the story of Kabi Malik of the Lanhu, uh, when he talked about the uh, Baitul Aqaba, when the people from came from Medina, uh, their leader decided to pray on his own towards Makkah. Uh, the others objected. They said that Rasulullah prays towards uh, Jerusalem, so why are you praying towards Makkah? He said, No, I feel better when I pray towards Makkah. I think that is how, what we should do. Uh, when they reached Rasulullah in Mac in uh, uh, in, in Mina, when they met him in Baitul uh, for the Baya, uh, they asked him, they told him, this is what our leader was doing. Uh, and he, saw, he asked the leader why. He, the leader said, this is the reason I was doing it. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, oh, there is no need to change it because we have, we have been praying towards Baitul Maqdis and you should have done that. You should not have changed. So this is how it was and it was, uh, you know. Now when they came to, to um, Medina, uh, they, it was also, they realized that it was also the Qibla of the Jews uh, in Medina and uh, so that's what they did. Now they used to pray towards uh, Masjid Al-Aqsa. Um, the changing of the Qibla and about 18 months, um, oh, I think I said 18 years, somewhere. anyway it's not 18, 18 years, it's 18 months uh, after the um, migration 18 months after Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to uh, Medina 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Quran uh, because Rasulullah's desire always was to pray towards the Kaaba. And if you see also what happened was, as I mentioned before, in, in Makkah when they were praying towards Masjid al-Aqsa, the Kaaba was in between. So you had from in the direction is the Kaaba first and then Masjid al-Aqsa. But in Madina now, Masjid al-Aqsa, they, they were opposite direction. Masjid al-Aqsa was north and Kaaba was south. So they actually had their back towards the Kaaba, so to speak, before they, uh, if they if, when they were praying towards Masjid al-Aqsa. And this is something that Rasulullah did not really like to do. And uh, he wanted to pray towards the Kaaba. And he would frequently look up uh, to uh, at the heavens, he were, and, you know, as if asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, and telling him that I'm doing this, but you know, ideally I would like to do, like to be praying towards the Kaaba. So, what 18 months uh, after he went to Medina, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala revealed surah, uh, the ayat in Surah Al-Baqarah, "Aud bilah min al-shaytan al-rajim." Qad nara taqalluba wajhika fi al-samai, falan waliyanna ka qiblatan tarbaha, fa wali wajhika shatar al-masjid al-haram. وَحَيْثُ مَا كُنْتُمْ فَوَلُّوا وُجُوهَكُمْ شَطَرَةً وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ لَيَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّهُ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَمَا اللَّهُ بِغَافِلٍ عَمَّا يَعْمَلُونَ Allah said, Verily, we have seen the turning of your Muhammad Sallallahu face towards the heaven. Surely we shall turn you to a qibla, which is the direction of prayer that will please you. So turn your face in the direction of the Masjid al-Haram in Makkah, which is the Kaaba. And uh, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, And whosoever of your people turn your faces in prayer uh, in that direction. So this is a general, general order being given to him and to whoever uh, your people are, Allah said, turn your faces in prayer in that direction. And, who, and where, wheresoever you people are, Turn your faces in that direction. And this is a global command. Wherever you are in the world, turn towards the Kaaba when you pray. Certainly the people who are given the scriptures, that is the Jews and Christians, know well that your turning towards the Kaaba, towards the direction of Kaaba in Makkah, is the truth from their Rabb. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not unaware of what they do. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning this uh, very clearly as far as the change of <coughs> direction of the uh, of the qibla is concerned and allah is saying this is what you should do turn your your uh, self towards the direction of the uh, of the qibla of the kaaba uh, because this is what and allah allah is saying very clearly that you are uh, allah has done this because you wanted this to be done and allah has seen the way uh, you have been looking at uh, you know, at, at the uh, looking towards the heavens, um, asking or apparently asking for this change to be done. This also shows the beautiful position of Rasulullah Sallallahu where Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala did these things to please him. Now think about this: for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, direction or anything is not important. Allah is Allah. If you're, when you're, even our ibadah is not important for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. It is really our ibadah is for ourselves. And uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving this uh, honor, this waqar to Rasulullah sallallahu uh, this is because of his love for his, uh, for his messenger, for his Habib Muhammad sallallahu Now this, um, uh, this command came during the Asr Salah and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was uh, praying uh, Asr uh, when this Ayat was revealed. So they were praying Asr facing Masjid al Aqsa when this ayat was revealed. And Rasulullah turned while he was praying, he turned without hesitation, accurately facing the Kaaba. Uh, obviously, there was no compass and no scientific instruments and so on to check exactly the direction. And he just he just turned, and of course, as I said, this is this happened in the second Hijra, second. Uh, year of migration, 18 months after he migrated to Medina, um, and most uh, historians date it to the middle of the month of Shaban. So this happened, and of course, then that, that from then onwards, the the Muslims they prayed towards uh, towards Makkah. Uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
was praying in, in a particular masjid where this happened. So he is praying this way and then he moved and he came this way. The people all turned. Um, and that masjid is called Masjid al, -Qib masjid al Qiblatayn, um, Masjid of two Qiblas. Huh? I don't know why, why don't they call it Masjid al Qiblatani because it is two, two is, 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 is uh, Qiblatayn is many Qiblas. Anyway, in this case it is two Qiblas. Uh, this is in uh, Medina. This is a few kilometers from the uh, from the Masjid al uh, uh, from from uh, Masjid al Nabawi Sharif, uh, and it's one of the oldest masajid in the world. And it has uh, uniquely two mihrabs on opposite sides: one in the direction of Masjid al Aqsa, and the other one is in the direction of uh, of Makkah. Nabi Sallallahu was obviously very <coughs> pleased with this change. He uh, he didn't like to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly for it, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of course knows what's in the heart and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, made that. And as we can see from the, uh, from the ayah, Allah said, and uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the ayat after that, Allah said, and we did not make the qibla which you used to face, except that we might make evident who would follow the messenger from who would turn back on his heels and indeed it is difficult except for those whom Allah has guided. Then the Muslims of course promptly changed their direction <coughs> in the Salah towards the Kaaba and that became the uh, Qibla from then onwards for all Muslims. The Medina, the, the Jews in Medina, uh, they uh, reacted differently to this thing. Uh, they started instigating a campaign of criticism uh, and they said that uh, the change of Qibla uh, is what deprived them from accepting Islam. Now they had not accepted Islam even before that, for 18 months when they when the Qibla was in the direction of Jerusalem. But you know, people make excuse, excuses. Allah has left it open for everybody. You want to accept Islam, accept Islam. There's no need to make any excuses. You don't want to accept Islam, no problem. Don't accept Islam. Um, they used to um, so they claim that you know they, that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi should should adopt should become a Jew instead of calling on the Jews to accept Islam. So the new this campaign also the idea was to sow dissent among the Muslims to say that here was uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi he was already praying uh, in the direction of Masjid uh, Al-Aqsa. What was the need to change and so on? Um, for us Muslims. The Kaaba is the oldest masjid in the world. It was great. It was constructed by Ibrahim Ali Salam, and uh, <clears throat> it was the it was the place of the monotheists for the people who are not idolaters, and uh, also for the Arabs, it was you know in their in their land, uh, in their in their uh, holy city, and uh, so Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave that to the Muslims. It also became a unique identity of the Muslims, just like the Adhan, which is unique in terms of how we call to prayer, just like the Salah, which is unique uh, in how we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, different from the prayer of anybody else. And this was a test also for the true Muslims to see who believed Rasulullah and uh, uh, to, to separate them from the uh, hypocrites. So this is a, uh, you know, it was a, uh, something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, did and of course Allah knows the reasons yeah, but there seem to be multiple reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, chose to do this uh, thing. Inshallah uh, this is uh, also one of the tests as I told you it's a uh, you know, test that came to the Muslims we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us from all his tests. Um, in uh, after the change of the uh, Qibla towards uh, the Kaaba, um, they built a shed uh, in, uh, in the, on the side of the old Qibla uh, in Masjid al Nabawi Sharif. It was called the Sufa. Uh, Ibn al Hajar al Asqalani said, he said the Sufa was a shaded place behind the Masjid al Nabawi, which was prepared for strangers or foreigners who came into Islam or came to Medina and they had neither any family or wealth. Now Abu Huraira uh, was one of the Ashabu Sufa. He said the Ashabu Sufa are the guests of Islam. And they are the ones who have no family or, or wealth uh, to, fa to fall back on. <coughs> Abu Huraira himself 
did have some wealth when he made hijra but he chose to devote his time to study islam and so so he stayed with the ashab sufa uh, uh, ibn umar radhiyallahu anhu I was also one of them. He also had wealth. He was the son of Umar bin Khattab radhiyallahu but he also chose to stay uh, in with Sufa in order to learn because Sufa became like a the center of learning also because there was a proximity of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, proximity to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, proximity to Masjid Nabi Sharif. So it was a very 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 uh, you know special place. Uh, Abu Hurairah radhiyallahu said uh, also that some people say how is it that Abu Huraira narrates more a hadith while the Muhajirin and Ansar don't. Uh, he said the fact is that my brothers from the Muhajirun were busy in business uh, while I would follow uh, Rasulullah on an empty stomach. So I was present when they were absent and I would remember when they would forget. The Ansar were busy uh, with their farms when I was a while I was a poor man and I would remember what they wouldn't or they couldn't uh, so this is uh, you know how he uh, became the person who has uh, communicated and narrated the m- most number of hadith in Islam he devoted his life completely to study uh, he said split the night into three parts one part I would sleep, another I would pray, and the third part I would review. As he would recall and uh, he would memorize the ahadith that I had uh, heard during the day. So, very important for us to uh, remember this because this is one of the finest evidences and proofs to say that the ahadith, to show that the ahadith were collected and preserved during the life of Rasulullah uh, himself and the allegation that this was done a hundred years later and two hundred years later is a lie. Um, There are many other such incidents and ahadith. This is not the the place for me to give you that evidence but please anytime anyone tells you that the ahadith were collected by Imam Bukhari and others hundred years later, two hundred years later, this shows that the person is either ignorant or person is trying to, to, to create mischief by so, sowing doubts about a hadith. The hadiths were collected by the Sahaba like Abu Huraira, Radhi Allah Anhu, Kaab bin Malik and others in the lifetime of Rasulullah They memorized them, they wrote them down, they used to repeat them to Rasulullah and, and tell him, Ya Rasulullah this is what you said, is that correct? He would confirm and they would write it down and they would confirm it. To the extent that a person uh, once asked one of the one of the scribes of a hadith, and there were over forty of them, which they who, who have been recorded, and of course there are many more. <coughs> so one of them asked Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he said, "Ya Rasulullah sallallahu sometimes you are angry and you say something in anger. Should we record and keep that also?" Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi said, "By the one in whose hand is the life of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi this tongue and he." held his tongue like this. He said, this tongue is in the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So say whatever, write down and record whatever I say because I, this is protected. My, my word, my speech and word is protected. So Alhamdulillah, uh, we have in the uh, hadith of Rasulullah sallam, we have without, exa- without, without any doubt, and I'm not exaggerating, I'm not saying this, uh, purely as uh, a Muslim, out of my uh, aqidat, out of my love and respect for my deen. I am saying this also from a completely objective perspective that there is no body of knowledge that is so authentically preserved with all uh, historical evidence towards its truthfulness as the body of a hadith of Rasulullah As a um, as, as, a, as a, what's the way, best way to say it, as a bonus from this preservation of hadith came what came to be known as the Ilmul Rijal. Ilmul Rijal or Ilmul Asma Rijal, the, the knowledge of the names of the people or knowledge of the people. This, this referred to those people who narrated a hadith. So each of them, like Abu Hurairah for, for example, each of them was investigated and this is not just the Sahaba, this is all down the line. Um, 
the Sahaba, of course, all of them are considered to be what is called Thikha, which is that they are, they are truthful and they, uh, their testimony is uh, worthy of uh, being taken. But after the Sahaba, all the people who came who narrated the Hadith, uh, they were investigated and their biographies, including details like uh, who was this person, who was his father, who was, you know, where was he born, what was his uh, village, his, his tribe, his family and so on. And then how, how was he perceived, how was he seen in society, was he known to have a good memory or a bad memory, uh, was he a person who was respected, was he a person who ever told a lie, was he a person who kept his uh, trust and so on, all kinds of details like this uh, pointing to the man or the woman and their character. And there were many hadiths which, uh, the, the health of the hadith, the seha of the hadith, uh, is dependent on the authentic, authentic, uh, authentic authentication of the narrator. And some hadiths are graded or, or rather downgraded because the person narrating had a fault in his or her, uh, himself or herself, uh, in one way or the other. So this is a huge body of knowledge uh, that simply does not exist in any other uh, culture or tradition, which Alhamdulillah, thanks to the preservation of a hadith, uh, of Rasulullah exists in uh, Islam. There is a beautiful book by uh, Mufti Taqi Usmani Dawad uh, called Authority of the Sunnah. Authority of the Sunnah, uh, I will inshallah uh, put that in the description of this, uh, of this video. <coughs> uh, that is a book worth reading. It's a small book but beautifully researched, beautifully written and uh, it is well worth reading. And that is the best refutation of those who claim that the hadiths are uh, not sound uh, and the hadiths uh, should be discarded. Anyone who discards an entire body of hadiths, the entire body of hadiths uh, as being unsound is, uh, has left Islam, as simple as that, right? There's no doubt about this. Um, anyone who, discard, who discards or, dis, or uh, denies or refu refuses uh, to accept a Sahih Hadith, a Hadith which is uh, which is authentic and authenticated, uh, this person is committing a, a very major sin which is bordering on Kufr. So please don't fall, fall into this trap. To come back to the Ashab of Sufa, they used to live by uh, the uh, Sadaqat that Rasulullah used to send to them. Um, and he would send also from the, send to them gifts that he uh, received from people from time to time. Uh, all those he would give to the Ashab Sufa. So they were the guests of Islam, they were the guests of Rasulullah Sallallahu He would also encourage uh, the Sahaba, especially the wealthy Sahaba, to take the Ashab Sufa to their uh, homes and uh, to feed them. And he said, whoever, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi said, whoever has food for two should take, should take a third, and whoever has food for three should take a fourth. Uh, he said in another hadith, he said the food for two, uh, so the food for one is enough for two, the food for two is enough for four, and the food for four is enough for eight. So this is uh, hospitality uh, has always been a uh, part of Islam from the beginning. It is part of our culture to feed people, to be hospitable to people, uh, to invite people home. Uh, you know, to take care of people. There's a great barakah in this. Rasulullah as a Sahaba, uh, Sayyidina Ali Radhiallahu for example, would uh, would get very upset and very worried. And uh, once he came to know his uh, and he said, uh, you know, is Allah displeased with me? So Rasulullah said, why are you saying that? He said, because I haven't had a guest for the last three days. Nobody has come uh, to me. Imagine this. I mean, today we find guests to be a pain. And that's also because we have complicated our own lives. Yes? If you want to guest, you, you have to, you feel you have to redo your whole house, right? And, and you have to kind of, uh, you know, cook these uh, massive meals of uh, wonderful things. Uh, so you complicate your lives. And when a guest comes, it's a big pain and uh, you don't want, you don't want guests. But uh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said a guest comes, he eats his own rizq and he, uh, he, he, has, he gets your uh, sins forgiven. Hmm? He comes, he eats his own risk and your sins are forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Simplify it. A guest is coming, uh, let him eat what you eat, 
you know, he will be in your house in, in, in whatever state your house is. Alhamdulillah, uh, Muslims are supposed to be clean and neat and, uh, you know, decent people. So it's, your house will obviously not, uh, you know, look like a disaster area. Uh, so it's a good idea also to therefore keep a, keep a house which is neat and clean. But don't complicate your own life and thereby deprive yourself of the blessings of having guests in your house. This is a very important thing. The guest is coming, he is eating his own risk and your sins are being forgiven. What's your allergy to having your sins being forgiven? Right? Is there a problem with that? If, if your sins are forgiven, invite people, feed people. This is, this is the way of winning the uh, pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of cooling the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The very first advice that Rasulullah gave to people in Madina when he reached Madina was, he said, spread salam. Right, so greet people, spread salam, then he said, feed people. And then he said, stand in the night and pray while people are sleeping and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make your path to Jannah easy. So, spread salam, feed people and pray tahajjud. These are the three uh, keys to success and Rasulullah is the one who uh, mentioned that and, and advised us to do that. Nabi used to give precedence to the Sabu Sufa even over his own family. One day, said Aisha Siddiqa, uh, <coughs> uh, not said Aisha, said Fatima to Zahra, one day uh, she said to Sayyidina Ali uh, that you know she was uh, she was very tired. She had a lot of things to do, uh, so she said it will be good if I have some help. So uh, they had just received, Rasulullah had uh, received a bunch of uh, prisoners of war from one of, the, uh, from one of the battles. So she said to Sayyidina Ali uh, go and ask him to give one of those people to us uh, so that I can have some help in the house. Now Rasulullah also knew about her suffering and difficulty and uh, Sayyidina Ali also knew, but when Sayyidina Ali asked uh, Nabi, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, By Allah, I will not give you while Ashabu Sufa are hungry, because they have no money and I have no money to spend on them, so I am going to free these slaves and spend that money for them. Right? So this is the, uh, this is the position of the Ashabu Sufa. Uh, on an average, the Ahlu Sufa, as they were called, or Ashabu Sufa, they were about 70 or so on an average. Uh, they would live full time in Sufa. They would do what work they could, but they were full time students so that there wasn't too much money. Uh, they didn't have too much money at any time. They would collect dead seeds and crush them and sell that as animal feed. Rasulullah used to send new Muslims to the Ahlu Sufa to, for them to teach them Quran. These people would keep these new Muslims, they would feed them and keep them as their own family and teach them Islam. This is one of the uh, one of the big deficiency areas uh, today. When a person accepts Islam, everybody welcomes him and say, "Oh, mashallah, mashallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, takbir," and uh, you everyone you know hugs that person, kisses that person. Uh, sometimes people also give them some money, and that's it. After that, we completely lose track. We don't follow up on them. We don't see are they learning any Islam? Uh, are they practicing Islam? What are they doing? To the extent that many uh, of the new Muslims have complained that when they accept Islam, obviously most of the time they get rejected by their own family. So now this person had a family, they were with people, uh, suddenly now they are, even if they are not homeless, they are certain, they're certainly cut off from their family. So they are friendless, uh, they are like yatim, you know, they are like orphans. Uh, and nobody takes them in. Now again, I'm not talking about physically taking anybody in, I'm talking about companionship, meeting, bringing, uh, you know, bringing them home, maybe, maybe giving them a meal or something, uh, helping them to learn, teach. Uh, taking care of new Muslims is a very, very important element which we seem to have lost somewhere. And uh, we, they have material needs. They have, uh, it's not only, it's not only, uh, you know, theolo theology, not to not only just teach them about Islam and so on and so on. One of the big things is marriage. Now this person uh, who came into Islam, he obviously cannot marry uh, non-Muslims 
Uh, but Muslims don't want to give their daughters to uh, those people. They don't want to give their sons to those those women because they think that you know oh, this is a new Muslim, uh, you know lineage and this and that and whatnot. Now this whole issue is something which is so serious and it is so important for us to get out of this. This is a very very uh, you know bad thing and reflects very badly. Um, the uh, so these people are they get uh, stuck with this. And many people, uh, they, they they leave Islam. Uh, in, in, in America, I don't know I, uh, how far this uh, uh, this information is true, but uh, I saw somewhere that the number of people who enter Islam uh, in America is equal to the number of people who leave Islam. So it's almost like equal. They they come in. It's like a revolving door. You know, coming through here, go out through there. And the, one of the biggest reasons of, for, for that is the way that new Muslims are treated. I mean, they are mostly ignored and left. Uh, in many cases, uh, men marry uh, non-Muslim women. They become Islam, they become Muslim, and then they are ill-treated in the in the home. Now, this, these are all very shameful things. I strongly, strongly, strongly advise you and myself. Let us stay far away from this because this is a way of incurring the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't need that, believe me. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to live by the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu and to create this beautiful model of uh, an ideal society, an ideal family, an ideal companionship that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa presented to the world. It's for us to relive that and to, uh, to bring that out into the uh, into the public so that people see that not by talking about it but by demonstrating it